And, and you know, over the, the course of my time here, we've seen different things change, just small little things. And I, I've realized that it's a very human, a very normal thing to look back and wonder what could have been. You know, there's, there's those big events that happen in our lives and everything is, is great and wonderful. And we usually chalk it up to us making really good decisions. But when something goes wrong and we still feel the aftermath of that years and years later, we tend to look back and say, well, what if I had, what if I had studied a little bit harder? What if I had practiced a little bit more? What if I had done just a little bit more work? What if I had been better? And we live in the aftermath of our decisions, those difficult things. But it's not just decisions we make. Sometimes life just happens to us, and we're stuck with what comes after. Three years ago, I was preaching a sermon, and I said, I don't ever want to talk about COVID again. And here, three years later, I'm still referencing it because we're still feeling the aftermath of COVID-19. What happened to us? Lockdown. Those of you who are old enough to remember 9-11 and where you were when you found out that the towers were hit, when the Pentagon was struck, we're still living in the aftermath of 9-11. So much has changed since then. But I believe that there is one series of events that has had more aftermath in our lives than anything else. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what the effects on the early church were because of that and how that still continues to affect us today. Today, we're going to be looking at John's uh, uh, account of what happened after the resurrection. We're just going to work our way through the, the book of John this morning. So I'm going to start us off with the first word. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. John has written his entire letter, which we call a book now, and we've divided it up into chapters and verses so we can reference back and forth to it, but it was one continuous piece of writing when he wrote it. And he's written what we call 20 chapters, and now he gets to the very last part of his writing, and it's almost like he has written everything to get us to this point of chapter 21. So John has, has described Jesus coming to earth, him inviting in disciples to follow him. He's talked about the difficulties that he had and the, and the victories that the disciples had with him. And then he got to the part where Jesus is betrayed, where he's arrested, where he's beaten, where he's crucified, where he dies and buried, and then where he is resurrected. And then John puts afterward, in the aftermath of all this other writing, everything that he's chronicled about Jesus' life, now Jesus has appeared to the disciples again, and he says, it happened this way. This is an eyewitness account. John hasn't written his account of Jesus with hidden treasures in it. He hasn't written it full of metaphor. No, he has written it as his account of the events that see, he saw happen and how the Holy Spirit has encouraged him to write this down. And he immediately jumps into verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, that means twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and, their two, and two other disciples were together. So he then goes in and adds in a few more eyewitnesses to the events that took place. And he includes himself in this and the sons of Zebedee. Him and James were the sons of Zebedee. Um, and so they're all gathered together. And we're going to find out in just a minute that they're in Galilee. And they're probably at the, the disciple Peter's house because he lived on the shore uh, of the sea, and we're going to see him go fishing in just a minute. But he's now, he's setting up, this is why I know what has happened, happened, and this is who else was there with me to, to witness the things that were happening. And then the next thing he says is, Peter tells them, I'm going out to fish. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught 
nothing. James, John, and Peter were professional fishermen. They had grown up. Before they met Jesus, this is what they were doing. But then they meet Jesus, and for three years, they are out following their rabbi. They're out following, learning from him, doing the things that he was doing. And now Jesus is raised from the dead, and things are a little bit different. And they're probably more different for Peter than anybody else. Because while all the disciples turned away from Jesus, Peter's the one that denied him three times. And so when Peter says, I'm going fishing, this isn't just, I need something to do. I'm a little bit bored. Hey, let's go relax out on the water. Now, I love sitting by water quietly, but I'm not going to fish. I feel guilty about catching fish and throwing them back. No shade on anybody that enjoys that. That's just not my thing. That's not what Peter's saying. He's not saying we're going to go out and relax. During a difficult time in in ministry a number of years ago, um, I said to Anna, I just want to go work at a farm and take care of plants. The ministry we were a part of had a farm, and I was like, maybe they'll transfer me there because things are rough right now and I can't handle it. And she looked at me and she said, you will never be happy doing that again. Before I got into ministry, I was working in a greenhouse and taking care of plants. When I said to her, I just want to go out to the farm. That was me wanting to go backwards, not forwards. It was so difficult what I was going through in the moment, and I just wanted to run from it. That's what this means when Peter says, I'm going out to fish. He's returning back to who he was before he met Jesus. And we know that he betrayed him, and he must have been carrying such shame in this moment. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, there's a group of women who have gone to the tomb. They're looking for Jesus. An angel meets them. He says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Go tell the disciples and Peter that he is risen. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where you've felt like you're and Peter, but I have been so close to the group that I want to be associated with, and yet still on the outside. I'm sure in a room this size, there are many of you here today that feel like you're and Peter, like you don't belong among the people of God, like somehow you've snuck in and nobody noticed that you don't belong here. But I want to speak directly to you for just a moment that the church that God's people are full of and Peter. And everyone in our lives does something and we feel like we don't belong among the people of God, that we haven't earned our way in, but the good news is that there is no earning your way in. You're either choosing to follow Jesus or you're not. And so if you, that's you today, if you have been struggling with feeling like you are on the outside I want to let you know that you are welcome here, that you belong here, and we are grateful that you took the time to be among the people of God. And it's interesting to me in this text that, um, that the disciples go and they're encouraging Peter. If this is the choice you're going to make, we're going to come along with you. Everything was so different from, for, with them after the resurrection. They had spent almost every moment of every day following Jesus for three years, and then he's just popping in and out to visit with them here and there. And so they're trying to figure out what is going on in life. And so they go fishing with Peter, and they catch absolutely nothing. And they've been out all night. I'm sure they're tired I'm sure they're a little bit discouraged. Peter's probably thinking, man, I can't even do this right anymore. And the next thing we see is early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. I think Jesus is messing with the disciples. Because that word that the NIV has generously translated friends is actually little boys. 
And he's not asking, did you catch anything? He's not asking, are they biting? He says, haven't you got any fish? Because he knows they've got nothing. Hey, little boys, maybe it's time to return daddy's bow and all his equipment. It was a great attempt, but I think time's up. Why don't you come on in? And so I love that John just says no is their reply to him. I'm sure one of them said no, but I'm sure there were some other things coming out of the disciples' mouth as well. But he just chooses to give this nice, simple response. Maybe they were just tired and had no words to say what they were really, really feeling. But then Jesus goes on and says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So I was reading through this. I, I thought of my friend Tom, who I think was born a firefighter, spent all of his career, as far as I know, fighting fires, and now teaches firefighters how to fight fires. This would be like if I said to him, hey, Tom, have you tried putting water on the fire? (laughs) Anybody who's been in a professional situation has probably been told how to do their job by somebody who's never done it before. And so I'm sure that if they weren't already tired and exhausted now, the disciples are feeling a little bit fiery. And yet, to their credit, they listened to Jesus. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. So now there's this huge, miraculous catch. It turns out the fish were just hiding on the other side of the boat the whole time. (laughs) Going on to verse 7, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off. He had been fishing in his underwear and jumped into the water. John, who is the apostle whom Jesus loved, he, he writes about himself in that way in his narrative. Um, He's the first person to pick up on what's going on. And he points it out to Peter. See, if this story sounds familiar, but the details feel a little bit off, maybe you've recently read the account in the book of Luke, chapter 5, about the miraculous catch there. Peter and James and John, they were business partners. They had been out fishing all night. And they had brought their boats to the shore after having caught absolutely nothing. And then this guy, Jesus, comes up to them and says, Hey, Simon, can I borrow your boat? And Peter says, Sure. And so he sets off a little bit off the shore, and he begins teaching the people. And after Jesus is done teaching, he says, Why don't we go fishing? And Peter says to to Jesus, Look, we were out all night, and we caught nothing. But if you say so, I will. Because Peter has now heard Jesus say something that makes him think that this man is worth listening to. And so he casts the nets into the water. And there is such a miraculous catch that they can't even pull the fish in. And so he has to call other boats to help him pull it in. And John remembers this moment as they're hauling in this new miraculous catch. And he says to Peter, this is your moment. This is when Jesus first called you to follow him. It's the Lord. This is Jesus. And Peter is so excited. He puts his clothes on and then jumps in the water. And so Peter's struggling, swimming to the shore, and John documents it this way. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. Thanks, Peter. For they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. That's about from here to the wall and back again. It's, it's just shy of two Olympic swimming pool lengths. I probably can't swim that far, but good for Peter. The boat's coming in, and they're... Good job, Peter. Keep going. They're clapping him in. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Just keep that that charcoal fire in mind for a minute, would you? Jesus has, has cooked them breakfast. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. 
So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat. There you go, Peter. And dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many of them, the net was not torn. John is remembering back to that first miraculous catch where the nets were torn and saying, but this time Jesus did an even bigger miracle. The nets weren't torn. And why 153 fish? Because this is John's eyewitness account. You can find all sorts of reasons why it might be 153. But I think that John was part of the group that was counting the fish and there were 153 of them. And Jesus said, come and have breakfast. So they sit down. They've worked all night long and Jesus is providing for them once again. And I think probably in this moment, as their bodies are starting to realize just how tired they are, this must have been an incredibly sweet moment. They're just sitting together. It must have felt like the band was back together. The crew got together for one more job. Everything must have felt right for just a moment. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, this is an interesting detail to put in here um, because they know it's him, but they're not going to ask, is it really you? Which would make sense if you know who somebody is. But as I was thinking through this, I remembered a moment um, where I ran into somebody from college in a church. And now, I had earned myself a pretty bad reputation in college. It was well-deserved. <laughs> it wasn't rumor-based. I made a lot of really bad decisions. And so whenever I would encounter anybody that I knew from college, I would try and keep the conversations as short as possible and just move on as quickly <laughs> as possible. And so here I am in church, and I see somebody that I went to college with, and they're down at the other end of the hallway. And I had this moment of panic within me. And I realized he hasn't seen me yet. I can go the other direction. And so I did. Because I didn't think if, if he re-met me again, that he would have given any space for things to be different. It took a few times, but eventually we had to meet each other again. And thankfully, he didn't remember most of who I had been, and he was full of grace, and he understood that, that people grow and develop and change, and that when Jesus meets us, we're able to walk away from so much stuff. But things were different. And since then, I've been able to run into people from college, and they've had to ask, What's different about you? And so there's just something different about Jesus in this moment after his resurrection. Things will never be the same for the disciples again. They're never going to be the same. Uh, Jesus is never going to be the same rabbi he was. Things are going to get better, but they're still in that tension of what that actually means and what it looks like. And Jesus came, he took the bread and gave it to him. And here's where I think things click on another level for the disciples, because there's another story in John chapter 8 with bread and fish. Once again, Jesus had been out teaching to thousands of people. The, the Bible says that there were 5,000 men. And in ancient times, when the Bible was written, when it says 5,000 men, it just means men. It doesn't account for the women and for the children. And so there were probably, at a minimum, 15,000 people here. And Jesus has been, been teaching. And when the apostles come to him and say, the people are tired, they're hungry, let's send them home. And Jesus is like, why don't we feed them? And the disciples are like, because we don't have any food, Jesus. It would take a whole village to fill, the, fill all these people's bellies. We got nothing. Except there is this one kid who's got some fish and some bread. And so Jesus said, great, that's perfect. Bring it to me. Jesus prays over the meal and he starts breaking the bread and the fish and giving it to the disciples. And they in turn, Jesus says, he, he tells them to go and feed the people. And so they in turn take the bread and the fish and they start breaking it and handing it 
to the people, and there's leftovers. Everybody had their fill. Everybody's doing great. They've now participated with Jesus in a miracle. And so I have to believe that as they're sitting around this fire and Jesus is handing them bread and fish, they're remembering that this is Jesus, this is the Messiah, this is the one that takes care of his people. He shepherds them, he feeds them well. But then the meal ends. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And I'm sure that Peter sank down in his seat just a little bit as Jesus looked at him across the charcoal fire because this moment would have stirred up memories of his betrayal. There's only two times in the entire Bible that charcoal fire is mentioned. There are hundreds of times that fire is mentioned, but only twice that it is specifically referred to as a charcoal fire. The other time, John also records in chapter 18, Peter has been following Jesus after his uh, arrest, and he's now in a courtyard. Jesus is being um, interrogated, and somebody comes up to Peter, who is warming himself over a charcoal fire that the soldiers have built because it's cold. Somebody says, you're one of his followers, aren't you? And Peter says, no. Another one says, you, you have a Galilean accent. Surely you are one of this man's followers. And again, Peter says, no. And then a third person comes up to, to Peter and says, I saw you last night in the garden while Jesus was being arrested. And Peter says, no, absolutely not. May God deal with me ever so severely if I'm one of his followers. The book of Mark describes Peter's last denial of Jesus as cursing himself. And the way the original language is, is put together, it could be that he's actually cursing Jesus or the person asking the question. We just know that Peter is saying some choice words. Although it's probably not how we think of cursing in our society, in ancient times, the idea of cursing is to speak death over someone, where blessing is to speak life. And so whether it's over himself, the person asking the question, or Jesus, Peter is speaking death in this moment, in this moment of his betrayal. And the way Luke captures the scene, it says that, as Peter is denying Jesus for the third time, that Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. Over the charcoal fire, their eyes locked. And so in this instance, in John chapter 1, John is being very careful to make sure that we know that this is directly in alignment with what Peter has done in the past and how Jesus is dealing with it. And I used to read this and just think Jesus is a little bit cruel. Why would he address things this way in front of all the other disciples? Why would he put Peter through this? Why wouldn't he just yell at him and tell him that he screwed up? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, Jesus is being mean. Peter's feelings are hurt. But this is Peter who at the last supper, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, in front of all the other disciples, Peter gets up and says, no, Lord. I will never betray you. Even if all of these fall away, I will never betray you. And so in front of the same people that Peter shamed himself 
Jesus is now letting them know that this is the Peter that I believe in. I haven't given up on him and neither should you. I wonder if part of what hurt Peter was the fact that he's calling him Simon, son of John. When Jesus first met Peter, he was Simon, son of John. He was Simon Johnson. And Jesus comes and calls him to step away from, from the fishing and to come form a new life with him, to become a new person. And as Peter is following Jesus, he, he's learning, and people love to pick on Peter because his mistakes are all throughout the New Testament. And that's actually why Peter, after Jesus, is my favorite character in the Bible. Because if Jesus can take somebody like Peter, then maybe he can take somebody like me. Maybe I'm not as hopeless as I thought I once was. Because just like Peter, I am prone to put my foot in my mouth. I'm prone to say silly things and give outbursts, only to realize afterwards, I did it again. I think I need Jesus to get me out of this. But as, G as Peter has grown, as the disciples have grown, they're outside of the city of Capernaum. And Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? When you hear people talking about me, who do they say I am? It's, so the disciples answer, some say Elijah, some say a prophet, some say a teacher. And then Jesus looks at the disciples and says, who do you say I am? And Peter pipes up. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not given to you by man, but by my father in heaven. I am now going to call you Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I am going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Whatever you bind on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter, I'm going to use you to establish my forever family in such a way that that you will affect eternity. So when Peter hears Jesus calling him Simon, he's thinking about who he was before that moment, not who he was afterwards. And so of course it hurt. But Jesus doesn't see fit to leave Peter in this place of shame. And in the West, we don't really think about shame that much. We think more about guilt and innocence rather than shame and honor. And that is all throughout the Bible. But so is shame and honor. But because we tend to read with Western eyes, we miss the shame and the honor portions of it. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you grew up in shame and honor cultures, not like me, that was all guilt and innocence. Jesus is dealing with Peter's shame in this moment. In the aftermath of all of Peter's decisions, all the bad things he has done, Jesus is inviting him to live in the aftermath of the resurrection. This is why Jesus, when he calls him Simon, he also gives him the instruction. This is who you were. Do you want to go back to being who you were before you met me? Or do you want to feed my sheep? Do you want to care for my lambs? Do you want to build my church again? And so three times, Peter, do you want to stay who I've made you to be? Or do you want to go back where you came from? We have all met people who in a moment of crisis, when things got difficult, chose to go backwards and for the rest of their lives they have lived with regret. And Jesus is presenting this moment to Peter. You have a choice to move forward if you want to. It's not all going to be easy. In fact, he goes on to describe what's going to happen to Peter. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. From church history, we know that, that Peter was crucified. 
but he felt so unworthy of dying in the same way that Jesus had that he asked to be crucified upside down. And so after all of this, Peter chooses to follow Jesus. The last, the last verse I want to share with you, 19, then he said to him, follow me. That's how this conversation ends. Follow me. Jesus' simple instruction, Jesus' simple invitation back to be who Peter always was created to be. My friends, the same is for us. We all have moments in our lives that we are terribly ashamed of. And if you've not dealt with them, they will continue to distort reality. That's what shame does. It hunches us over and forces us to look at ourselves. But when we're looking down, we can't see what's around us. If you've ever been in a situation working on a team and, and somebody says, man, we did a really good job with this, but I think we could improve here, here, and here. We can grow a little bit. There's so many people that when they hear something like that, what they hear is not how good they did. And where things can get even better, what they hear is, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I didn't do enough. That's what shame does to us. It distorts reality. I think this is probably a seed of perfectionism, of anger. Shame just gets down inside of us and it distorts the world around us. And Jesus' invitation is to move on from that, to live in the aftermath of the resurrection, to be set free from our shame and to live as the people of God as he created us to be. And I think today that Jesus wants to have a conversation over a meal with some of us. So worship team, you can come forward. We're going to take communion together. And I just want to invite you to be listening to what Jesus has to say to you as we take communion together. Some of you, it might be a difficult conversation where Jesus is taking you backwards to something that you thought maybe you had dealt with, something that you had moved on from. But he wants to have a deeper conversation because you're still carrying shame. You're still carrying pain. And he wants better for you. He wants to set you free from that. He's the only one that can. So in just a minute, I'm going to invite you to come down the center aisle to receive the bread and the cup. And those that are serving, you can get in position. Receive the bread and the cup. And think about Jesus' body being broken so that you can be set free from your shame. Think about the cup as the blood spilled for you because Jesus thinks that you were worth it. He didn't make a mistake by dying for you. He's proud of what he did, and he's proud of who you can become in him. And some of you just need to hear this. He's proud of you now. He doesn't look down on you with shame. He's not ashamed of you. You didn't disappoint him because you didn't surprise him with anything that you've done. He knew from the foundations of the earth every single mistake that we would make and that even if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, that we would continue to make them. And yet he said, man, I love those people. They have no idea what they are capable of. They would just follow me. They would just be willing to step into the difficult with me. I've got some amazing plans for them. So you can begin to come and receive the bread and the cup. We're going to sing a song and then I'll come back up and lead us in communion.